I neglected uh, to mention during the announcements that we do have another marriage event coming up in May, and this one is designed for specifically for couples who have been married between 6 and 19 years, sort of in the hectic years of child raising. And we still have a couple spots left. It's a one-night overnight in May, so if you want to find out more information, there are, I think, still some brochures in the lobby, or you can go to our website or on the app, and you can get yourself signed up for that one. We'd love to have you join us. Speaking of um, marriage, as a pastor, of course, I do lots of weddings, and all weddings are beautiful in their own way. Um, even the one I did here one time where all the groomsmen wore spurs. Even the one I did at a destination one time that was a Civil War dress-up theme. And then there was one that was a medieval. That one wasn't so beautiful in its own way. But, um, but weddings, of course, are, are, are detailed. There's lots of things in weddings that can go sideways. Um, I see Becky Beer smiling down here. She, for years, has coordinated weddings um, for us here at Chapel Street. And things can go sideways. I've seen a groom get violently ill right before he did his vows, which gave new meaning to in sickness and in health. I've seen a bride late to her own wedding. Uh, I saw a pastor late to a wedding he was supposed to do, and that was me. Um, it's a very, <laughs> very long story. I did an outdoor wedding on a golf course uh, a couple of years ago as a, as a giant thunderstorm approached, and you could see it and hear it, lightning and everything. Uh, did that wedding in nine minutes flat. We still all got drenched. A pastor friend of mine um, had a groom at the exchange of rings, dropped the wedding ring, took one bounce into a heating vent, and rolled right into the furnace in the church. But the biggest problem I had in a wedding was right here in the sanctuary uh, years ago, just minutes before the wedding was to begin. Everybody's all lined up, and the musicians are ready to go, and all of a sudden the lights went out. So I figured we had a blown fuse or something, but it was afternoon, so we could still see. So I figured, no big deal. I, you know, we'll, we'll just, we can see. We'll just go through the wedding. Then we realized um, the power was out so much so that we had no microphone. We had no air conditioning. We had no pipe organ. So we decided to check and see if it was a fuse. The custodian checked, and we found out it was like half the city of Geneva was out of power. So all we could do was wait. So we waited 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, Finally, we realized, uh, got together with the bride and her mother, um, and we were losing sunlight, so we, we just, we, we couldn't reschedule a wedding. All the guests were there, so we just decided the show must go on, and we lined everybody up, and we're going to do it kind of in the dim, and I was going to shout, and we were going to have no pipe organ, and we walked in, and right as we walked in the door, boom, the lights went on. And I was like, let there be light! Call that my uh, miracle wedding. So... I start with that story because we all know how dependent we are in our culture on power, especially electrical power. Without power, nothing works the way it should work. And we're in the third week of a series called The Holy Spirit. And you recall a couple of weeks ago we began in the Gospel of John as Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. And he promises that when he goes, the Father will send them another helper. And in fact, he says, it will be better for you if I go... Because then the Helper will come to be with you forever. And then last week we saw that the Holy Spirit specifically convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. And that the Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. Now today we're going to see that the Holy Spirit is also, according to Jesus, the source of power. A source of our power. In the very opening verses of the book of Acts, Luke tells us that after his death and resurrection, uh, Jesus appeared to his disciples and followers multiple times over a period of 40 days. He told them to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gifts the Father had promised. And then he says, for John, speaking of John the Baptist, baptized with water, but in a few days, he says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then we come to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where we begin today. Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the first thing we want to look at today is the promise of power. The promise of power. How many of you have ever run out of gas in your car? Anybody? That's a wonderful experience. Most of us have done it at least once. What happens when you run out of gas in your car? Right? First your car 
stops, right? You may coast for a while, but then you stop, and, and then you walk, or you call for help. And I've actually done both at different times in my life. No matter how new your car is, no matter how fancy your car is, no matter how impressive the engine is, without gas, a car goes nowhere. So what good is a car without gas? And I think we can ask the same question about faith, in a way. What good is faith without power? Here's a thought to begin with, the way I like to say it. Faith without power, or faith without the power of the Holy Spirit that leads us into a relationship with Almighty God is nothing more than an empty shell of religion. And religion by itself is nothing more than a car sitting in a driveway with no gas. It goes nowhere and does nothing. Jesus promises power. Again, Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now this is the very mission statement of the entire New Testament. This is the mission of the gospel. This is the mission Jesus had in mind from the very beginning. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's locally. In Judea, that's regionally. In Samaria, that's those unlike you, those you think of as being far from God, and to the end of the earth. And by the way, this is also the mission of this church, Chapel Street Church. Our Jerusalem is right here in the Fox Valley, what we call our neighborhood vision. Uh, we believe our God has called us to be a family of neighborhood churches committed to the transforming power of the gospel, helping people experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where you are. Our Judea, our Samaria, our ends of the earth are the focus of our Serve the World initiative to make the gospel visible through local and global ministry partners. Here are a few of them. Wayside Cross Ministries right in Aurora. That would be our region, our Judea, or how about... Um, Cure, or Life Water in Africa, or our ministries that we have in Turkey, or the 30 Chapel Streeters now, almost 30, that are serving full-time somewhere in the world. Uh, we raise almost over $300,000 every year outside of our budget just to give away to our local and global partners because we believe in this mission. Last weekend, you collectively gave $37,000 in support of our student mission trips that go this summer. That was through the servant auction, so thank you for that. We have sent kids, almost 200, 150 kids all over just to, to experience and take the gospel different places in the world. But in order to accomplish this mission, Jesus says, you're going to need gas in the tank. You're going to need power. So what is the power of the Holy Spirit? The word power in Greek used here is dunamis, from which we get our words dynamite or dynamic. And the power of the Holy Spirit is seen in all kinds of ways throughout the Bible. And in the New Testament especially. I'm just going to mention a few of them here. So bear with me here as I go through some New Testament texts. First, the power of the Holy Spirit is the power of new birth. In Titus chapter 3 we read, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through, watch this, Washing the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to believe and creates in us a new heart through the washing of forgiveness of sin, a new identity, the old in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come, a new purpose that as we participate in the kingdom of God through the church, and new destiny, eternal life in the new heaven and new earth. This is what theologians call regeneration. And this will be the focus of our entire message next week as we look at new birth. Secondly, the power of the Holy Spirit is the power of relationship. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are adopted into God's family. We receive a new identity and we experience relationship with God. Thirdly, the power of the Holy Spirit is the power to live more and more like Jesus. 
In Galatians 5, Paul says the fruit of the Spirit, what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is always trying to grow in all of us all the time. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. From the moment the Holy Spirit enters our lives as believers, from the moment we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit is working tirelessly to shape us into the image of Jesus himself. Theologians call that sanctification, the process of being made holy. Next, the Holy Spirit is the power to pray. Gives us the power to pray. Also in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. You ever feel like that? We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So the Holy Spirit enables us to pray, teaches us to pray, and sometimes prays for us. Fifth, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to resist sin and temptation. In Galatians 5, it reads, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Those are just a few of the many ways we see and can experience the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see these later as we keep going through this series. We'll have a whole message designed around several of these aspects of the Holy Spirit's power. But the passage we look at today is about, specifically, the power to be witnesses. What does it mean to be a witness? The Greek word used here is martyres, from which we get our English word martyr. And a witness is one who simply testifies to what they have seen and what they have heard. A witness testifies to what he or she knows to be true. In this case, the truth of Jesus, the truth of the gospel. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. That's our new identity in Christ. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now I'm aware that many times we think of a witness as someone like the late Billy Graham, standing in front of thousands of people and proclaiming the gospel, a witness. Or we think of a pastor or a missionary that we might support. Those are witnesses we don't necessarily think of ourselves. But I want you to see that's not how Jesus thinks about it. That's not how the Apostle Paul teaches about it. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Paul says, we are ambassadors of reconciliation. How? How do we do that? A couple of just small stories I've heard over the, over the years. One guy years ago told me um, at his place of work, um, he wasn't really uh, encouraged or allowed to uh, be very overtly Christian. He, he, he wasn't supposed to be sharing his faith in the workplace. They had sort of boundaries about that. But at lunchtime, whenever he went to lunch, he would simply bow his head for a few moments and thank God for his meal. It was his habit. It was his, his routine. And been at the same workplace for years. And finally, one day, uh, somebody approached him privately and said, Say, um, I know you're a praying man. Would you pray with me about this thing happening in my life? And the only thing he had ever done was sincerely, every day, pray over his meal in his workplace. And that sparked a long-term, serious set of conversations about faith, which led to the gospel, which led to faith. Another guy told uh, told a story of just being in casual conversation somewhere, and the subject of church or God came up sort of offhandedly, 
and this other person said, yeah, I guess I could use a little God in my life. I could use a little God in my life. To which my friend said, well, yeah, we all need God in our lives, but he's not little. Sparked a whole series of conversations, again, leading to faith. So what do we need to do to be witnesses? Just a few steps. First of all, we need to know the gospel and know our story and be able to talk about how those two stories intersect. Can you share your story and how the gospel intersected with you, how you came to faith in Jesus? That's being a witness. It means living out the gospel in all areas of our lives. It means being the same person at work on a Monday, in your cul-de-sac on a Saturday morning, that you are here in church on a Sunday. Just be the same person. Have the same kinds of conversations. Use the same language. Behave the same way. Engage people in spiritual conversation. Just in everyday interactions. Listen for people's questions. Listen for people's hurts. Listen for their struggles. Maybe offer to pray for someone. And a conversation develops. And you're a witness. Now notice, our job is not to save. That's what Jesus did. Our job is not to convict. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Covered that last week. Sometimes we get those messed up. We think we're supposed to be the ones who convict. We're not. Our job is to be witnesses. That is to bear witness to what we have seen and heard, what we know to be true. Jesus promised us the power to be his witnesses. The second thing we see here in Acts is the coming of power. The coming of power. About seven or eight years ago or so, a storm, uh, I think it was a summertime storm, blew through our, our, our area here in the Tri-Cities. And it packed some pretty strong winds, like up, upwards of 50 miles an hour. Just one of those kind of wild uh, spring or, or, or summer storms. And we were in our house. Um, it was, uh, I think, late afternoon. And just listening to the wind, it was really kind of awesome. It was, it, was, it was roaring wind, and it was unusually strong. And then all of a sudden, a burst of wind came that sounded like a freight train going right by our house, right in Batavia. And I heard a loud crack, and all of a sound ran to a front window, and I saw our driveway, and it looked like a tree was laying in our driveway, across our driveway. It was weird. We don't have a tree there. There's a tree in our driveway. And then I turned this way, and I saw... The top half of a tree right next to our house had snapped off. This wind snapped an 8-inch diameter tree trunk like a matchstick and blew the top of the tree into our driveway 60 feet away. I thought, what kind of wind right here in the suburb snaps a tree in half? Now, imagine this. Imagine the next day, another wind blew the opposite direction and blew the top of that tree right back onto that tree and put it back together again. That's the kind of power we're talking about here. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, now Pentecost, uh, sometimes we don't know the history of that word, it was a, um, a religious feast of the harvest. God had told his people uh, to celebrate the harvest in a feast 50 days after Passover. And the word Pentecost literally means 50 days. And so it was a, a celebration when Jews from all over the Roman Empire would come into Jerusalem for the celebration. So they're all in town. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, before we get too far into the story, I want to take just a moment to talk about the difference between that which is descriptive in the New Testament, and that which is prescriptive. What I mean by that is, uh, particularly here in the book of Acts, there are things that we read about, events that are described because they happened once and they aren't necessarily to happen again uh, in all of our lives. They're descriptive. And yet there are some things that are prescriptive that all of us as believers are to experience as a result of our faith. For example, Luke writes, they were all together in one place. I think that's prescriptive. This is the earliest reference to what would come to be called the church. This is the day the church is born. They were all together. The New Testament consistently tells us as followers of Christ, we should meet together 
regularly because there are things that happen when we are together that cannot happen and do not happen when we are by ourselves. This is pre-scripted. And next we see, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. I think this is probably descriptive. This is a unique manifestation of the Holy Spirit at that time in that place. That's not necessarily to happen every time we gather together. But it happened then. Same thing with tongues of fire. It's a descriptive event. A unique, miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit for God's purposes in that time, but not intended to happen every time we get together. Then we read, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think the Bible teaches us this is both descriptive and prescriptive. It describes a unique event, pointed to something that happened one time, but it also points to that which is to happen to all believers. Because over and over again, the New Testament urges us as believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Years ago, I was at a conference somewhere. Uh, I had probably just uh, begun my career as a youth pastor. And at this conference, a lady, um, we were in conversation, and, and she said, uh, when she found out I was a pastor, she said, what church? I told her. She said, well, is, is your church spirit-filled? I said, excuse me? She goes, is your church spirit-filled? And I was kind of confused because that's like asking, you know, is a Twinkie cream-filled to me? I mean, because the church is made up of people, all of whom believe in Christ, therefore have the Holy Spirit li- living in them. So by definition, the church is spirit-filled. But later I found out she was asking kind of a code question. What she was really asking me is, Do your, does your church teach a second baptism by the Holy Spirit that manifests itself specifically in the public speaking of tongues? That's what she meant. Now there are two primary opinions when it comes to this question of being filled by the Holy Spirit. The first, and what my position would be, but our church's position is largely, is that the Holy Spirit comes at salvation. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That's pretty clear. He also says in Ephesians 3, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Again, pretty clear. Paul is assuring us here that at the moment we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives. We receive the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet there are times, there are moments in our spiritual growth and discipleship when the Spirit, either due to our heightened obedience or our heightened attention, or the Holy Spirit simply decides to do something greater in our lives and through us than we ever imagined, that we experience as being filled powerfully. From the inside, we're filled. The Holy Spirit is never anywhere else, and it's never gone. It's always in us. We experience filling. There is another opinion that you many have heard and maybe heard taught, the so-called second baptism, that there's a second experience of the Holy Spirit that every believer is supposed to have, in which a believer receives sort of a second work of grace, an outpouring of the Spirit, usually highly emotional, that manifests itself in what are called the sign gifts. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a few weeks, meaning speaking in tongues, prophesying, healing, and that sort of thing. The problem with this view is that the New Testament nowhere teaches that all believers are to prophesy, or that all believers are to speak in tongues. It doesn't teach that. The New Testament does not teach two classes of Christians, spirit-filled and non-spirit-filled. It doesn't. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul summarizes, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So when we come to faith in Christ, Scripture says, We receive the Holy Spirit. We are baptized into the body of Christ by one Spirit. And as we grow, we can and do experience more and more and more of the power of the Holy Spirit. That's discipleship. That's spiritual growth. Okay, here's what we need to see today. 
In Acts 1, Jesus promised, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. In Acts chapter 2, the disciples are all together waiting. The Holy Spirit comes upon them with great power. And then in verse 4 we read, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This leads us to the third point today, which is the purpose of power. The purpose of power. How many of you studied a foreign language in school? Just out of curiosity, Spanish, French, something else, German, hmm? Latin, oh, Latin, oh, I hated Latin class. It's, that was the report card I lost on the way home, Latin class. That's a whole different story. Uh, well, I took, um, oh, how many of you have also, after having a class in school, actually got to travel to a place where they spoke that language and you tried to speak that language? Okay, how'd that go? I took Spanish in high school, even in college, and even lived in South America for six months at one point in my life. So at some point, one point in my life, I knew enough Spanish to kind of communicate a little. I was by no means fluent, but I could communicate a little. And uh, Years ago, we were taking trips every year with student ministries to the Dominican Republic. And so for that one week every year, I'd, I'd use some of my pidgin Spanish and get around and so forth. And um, often, they would, uh, just out of uh, desiring to honor the guest pastor, the pastor in the local church, whenever we went to church, would ask, would ask if I wanted to say something. Sometimes he'd just call me, so I'd kind of prepare like a little paragraph that I could kind of work my way through in Spanish. And I would usually check with a Spanish speaker, is this right? Am I saying it right? You know, just, just, just like three sentences. Um, and so that sure enough, this one trip, it happened, and they invited me, but I was kind of prepared my little paragraph. Um, but as I started, I suddenly, I, I got off script just for a sentence. And I, was, I wanted to say, um, I'm a little embarrassed about my Spanish. But as I started to say it, I realized I hadn't double-checked the word for embarrassed. So I just thought of the English word and I decided to sort of make it sound Spanish because some words will kind of work that way. Some of you know where I'm going with this. I said, estoy poquito embarazada de mi español. Everybody burst out laughing. I, didn't, I wasn't trying to be funny. I like it when people laugh and not when I don't think they should laugh. So I got through all my whole thing later. I said, hey, how come, why, what were they laughing about? He said, well, you just told them you were a little pregnant. <laughs> I learned that language, words matter and language matters. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, because they were all there for Pentecost, right? And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Notice, the disciples here are not speaking some unknown spiritual prayer language. Okay? They're speaking languages that are clearly understood by people from different backgrounds. It would be as if suddenly, in the Dominican Republic, I could speak fluent Spanish, and everybody understood me. Or suddenly, in Ukraine, I could speak Ukrainian, and they could all hear me. Or I'm in Iran, and I can speak Farsi. They were hearing real languages that they could understand. Verse 7, And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Now, I want you to see something here. The point of this story is not what we usually think it is. The point of this story is not that the disciples, the apostles, were speaking languages they'd never studied. That's interesting, but it's not the point. The point is people were hearing the gospel in a way they could understand. That's the point. Verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, and Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome. There's a reason why I'm reading all this. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. That's 15 different people groups already that are mentioned with possibly 15 separate languages and dialects, and they're all hearing it in their own language. That's the purpose of this passage. We hear them telling in our own lang tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine, which then, if you know the story, led to Peter's great sermon, and 3,000 people came to faith in one day. Here's the order of events. Jesus promised the Helper is going to come. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would bring power. 
That power would enable the disciples to become witnesses. That power would propel the gospel to the very ends of the earth. Then that promise is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes upon and within the disciples. They are empowered to speak languages they've never studied for the purpose of bearing witness to the gospel so that people from all different backgrounds could hear and understand in their own language. And we see the explosion of the church in the world. Now, what does all this mean for us? I was a freshman in college in 1974. I've told college stories before. Grown up in the church, and I come to faith in Jesus early in my life at age 8. was baptized when I was 12. And by the time I went to college, I thought I was pretty solid in my faith. But the school I went to was not a Christian school. And so I was exposed very quickly to a world that collided with a lot of the things I believed about how I was called to live. And I lived on a floor of 27 guys and pretty quickly discerned that I might be the only follower of Jesus on that floor. This is a picture of my floor. I know you're trying to find me in that picture. So I'll just tell you where I am. All the way to the right in the long coat holding a basketball in my right hand. That's me way over there. I'm hoping you don't notice that giant bottle in the middle of all those guys. That's kind of why I thought I might be the only one. So I kind of decided to keep my faith to myself. I didn't, I didn't consciously decide that, but I, it, it, I just did. So about two weeks into that false trimester, a bunch of us are sitting around the room late at night, after midnight, and one of the guys suddenly, out of nowhere, looks up at me and says, So, coffee, what makes you tick? I said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, what makes you tick? He said, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't cuss like the rest of us. I want to know what makes you tick. So I'd been trying to hide for two weeks, and yet my life sparked a kind of curiosity. Now here I was, immersed in their culture. I spoke their language fluently. So what did I do with a room full of guys who wanted to know? I mumbled something about uh, just not liking that stuff and tried to move the conversation to something else. That's what I did. I was a lousy ambassador that night. Lousy witness. Looking back, I realized I was just, I was immature in my faith. I didn't really know how to tell my story. Uh, and I was unaware of the power that had already been put into me by faith. I think this is what Jesus meant when he said in John 14, 12, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. He doesn't mean we're going to heal the sick. He doesn't mean we're going to feed everyone in our office with a sack lunch. He means that the Helper will come and will bring his power a power that will so fill our hearts that we will become his witnesses and the gospel will spread to the whole world, into the places where we work, into the neighborhoods where we play and ride our bikes, into college dorm rooms at 1 o'clock in the morning when guys want to know what makes you tick. That's what Jesus was talking about. I think Jesus was telling us that the Holy Spirit is the gas in the tank of the church. And the Holy Spirit is the gas in the tank of the believer. And so the question is, do we know his power? The question is, do we allow his power to make us his witnesses? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Stay with us as we continue to work our way through this series. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord God, we thank you today as always for your word. We thank you for your promise to send the helper. And that the Holy Spirit, through faith, would fill us with power. Help us to know your power, to trust your power, and to use your power to be your witnesses. In Jesus' name that we pray.
Let's stand together. Let's respond with this prayer.